In this lecture, we will finish our brief look at the artwork produced during the Baroque period and the transition to the Rococo, looking at Elizabeth Vigi Lebrun, and the Neoclassical period featuring Jacques-Louis David, along with the political events surrounding both. We will consider the effect that working for a royal patron like King Philip IV, the patron of Diego Velazquez, or Marie Antoinette, the patron of Elizabeth Vigi Lebrun, had on the artwork they created. We will look at the role of women in the French Academy of Art. Spoiler alert, it's a small one. We will review the French Revolution and look at the long career of Jacques-Louis David, the master propagandist for both the French Revolution and Emperor Napoleon, and the impact that these fluctuating allegiances had on the artwork he created. Then we will talk about the exciting shift that takes place as the old school patrons who had supported artists for hundreds of years, so royalty, the state, and the church, begin to diminish in importance. For the first time with Francisco de Goya, we will see an artist explore his own subjective reaction to the social and political events taking place around him, rather than reflecting only the opinions of his pa patron in his artwork, thus the emergence of modern art. After living through the unspeakable brutality of the French invasion of Spain, Goya expresses his deeply troubled vision of hell on earth in the black paintings on his living room wall. But the question remains, who will support artists if they don't have patronage from church and state? And we turn to the Baroque in Northern Europe and the work of Johannes Vermeer, who sells his paintings to the emerging middle class for that answer. We will conclude with a brief discussion of the use of the camera obscura to facilitate the creation of the illusion of three-dimensional de depth on a two-dimensional plane, the painting, uh, again with Vermeer. Another spoiler alert here, we are looking forward to the invention of photography, which we will discuss in our next module. All right, in this lecture, we will focus briefly on some artworks to illustrate the important points but you will need to refer to the external resources available on Canvas for a more complete discussion of these six paintings, which will be included on the quiz material. So Velázquez, Las Meninas, Vigi Lebrun, Self-Portrait with her daughter Julie, David, The Death of Marat, and Napoleon Crossing the Alps, Goya, The Third of May, and Vermeer, Young Woman with a Water Pitcher. Let's start with Diego Velázquez. Whereas Bernini may be considered the greatest sculptor of the Baroque, Diego Velázquez is often considered the greatest painter of the period. Born in Seville in southern Spain, Velázquez studied there and married his teacher's daughter at the age of 19. Soon thereafter, he moved to the Spanish capital of Madrid, where he became court painter to King Philip IV. As court painter with King Philip IV as his patron, Velázquez was obligated to represent the king and his family in a way that met with the approval of his boss. The use of mechanical devices to create the illusion of reality on a two-dimensional canvas. Velázquez used mechanical devices to make his work. He probably used a compass and mirrors, as had Caravaggio. Caravaggio was a very important inspiration to Velázquez. Velázquez is exceptionally concerned with reproducing optical reality, especially in his large canvas, Las Meninas. When you look at Las Meninas, notice all the different views, the different reflections, and the many du duplications of paintings in this one great canvas. French philosopher Michel Foucault suggests that Velázquez's painting, Las Meninas, is about the nature of representation. The images, the reflections in mirrors, and the depictions of the paintings within the painting of Las Meninas all add up to, quote, all the signs and successive forms of representation. Las Meninas, which is Spanish for the ladies-in-waiting, is a 1656 painting which is now in the Muse Museo del Prado in Madrid by Diego Velázquez. And here it is. Um, this large painting, so 10 feet by 9 feet, um, exceptionally detailed painting. All right, so the large 10 foot, 5 inch by 9 foot mysterious canvas 
shows the artist at work in his royal studio. So here he is. This is uh, Velazquez. And the, the studio is a dark cavernous space. It has windows to the viewer's right. So over on this side, you can see windows letting in light. And you can see all of the paintings which are hanging on the back walls of his studio. So this is the artist's studio with the artist and the windows. Uh, you can see a door in the back wall which is open and it frames a man who's either entering or leaving the room. So that's back here, second source of light. And this is the young Princess Margarita and her crew who have entered the studio from the right. The canvas that Velazquez is apparently working on occupies the left-hand side of the composition. So in this painting, the painter we have right here, is painting a canvas. And so you can see the back of the canvas here, which is propped up on this um, support here, so on the left-hand side. And he stands, brush and palette in hand, apparently just interrupted. So it's like, it's like we walked into the room and we interrupted him while he was painting. He looks a little cranky. So this painting contains a self-portrait of Velazquez. So here it is. He looks out toward the viewer, but, but as we, the viewer, can't see what he's looking at, and we also can't see what he's painting, because all we can see is the back of the painting. Are, are we the subject of his painting? We're certainly standing in the right place. As the viewer, we're implicated in the painting in multiple ways. Perhaps Velazquez is looking at and painting the king and queen, who are seen reflected in a mirror at the very back of the studio. So again, this sort of puts us in the position of where the king and queen would be standing if he was painting them. So now are we the king or the queen? Um, you know, we, we have we don't, there's a lot of, a lot going on. So this is very much one of the paintings within a painting that we see here. So you can see the back of the painting he's painting. We can see a picture of the king and queen that's painted as a reflection, but it certainly is a portrait of them. And then of course the portrait of the princess and then all of these paintings that he has on the wall. So um, there's, it's a complex um, image with a lot of looking and reflecting uh, going on in the painting. Las Meninas is also clearly about optics. The lighting of the room is so atmospheric and so convincing that the directors of the Prado Museum used to hang it alone in a room opposite a small wall suspended midway up, uh, a small mirror suspended midway up the wall. And viewers stood between the two looking into the mirror and seeing the painting reflected behind them as their optical um, environment. And this illusion was apparently so convincing that people spent long hours meditating on the realism of uh, Velazquez's masterpiece. Velazquez's painted investigation of seeing and being seen was every bit as rational and scientific and every bit as Baroque as Galileo's study of the moon with a telescope. All right, we're moving on to the French Academy of Art and Female Painters, and we have a self-portrait of Elizabeth Vigi Lebrun on this side. The French Academy had a contradictory attitude about women. At first, a few women were elected members, although they did not enjoy all of the privileges of male members. Women gained a certain prestige from membership, and they were given permission to exhibit in the, the yearly salons, but they could not teach, they could not compete for prizes, and they could not hold office in the academy. In 1786, the academy reversed its original policy and decided that no more women were to be admitted. A short time before they changed their rules, Elizabeth V.G. Lebrun gained membership in the academy, and that was in 1783. Elizabeth V.G. Lebrun was the most celebrated woman artist of her time. She was born in Paris. She was the daughter of a portrait painter and an art teacher. And by age 15, she was supporting her family with her art. She was a successful portrait painter in Paris by the age of 20. 
By 25, she was working for Queen um, Marie Antoinette, who was the wife of King Louis XVI. Fiji Le Brun became well known for her aristocratic portraits, often of women and their children, and for her self-portraits. In addition to her accomplishments as a painter, Fiji Le Brun ran a salon in her home. Throughout the 18th century, royal patronage of the art was supplemented by powerful Parisian ladies who ran influential private salons, and these were weekly social gatherings of the cultural elite which cultivated uh, refined conversation. Anyone who's been watching Bridgerton might uh, re relate. Um, this is one of V.G. Lebrun's uh, famous self-portraits, which includes her daughter, Julie. Please watch the external research resource on Canvas to learn more about this painting. Um, let's talk about uh, Elizabeth V.G. Lebrun and her relationship with her patron, uh, Marie Antoinette. Vigie Lebrun was an exceptionally fine portrait painter, and her service to her patron, Marie Antoinette, gave her a place of prestige and power in Parisian society at that time. While Marie Antoinette was in power, her association with Vigie Lebrun brought the painter opportunities to build her portrait business all over Europe. Her images of the queen and of the queen with her children are beautifully rendered with a lifelike immediacy. But like Diego Velazquez and his paintings for his patron, uh, King Philip IV of Spain, Vigi Lebrun was obligated to create a vision of Marie Antoinette that was agreeable to the queen. This vision shows Versailles life in all its beauty and grace. What her paintings do not show are the social realities outside the palace. The countrymen in the reign of King Louis XVI in France were struggling against the threat of constant hunger and worsening poverty. Eventually, in 1789, French workers in Paris rose up in armed protest of tax burdens and other social abuses. Vigie Lebrun escaped at the time of the revolution. She fled Paris the night the king and queen were arrested and continued her successes in other European capitals. She received aristocratic portrait commissions in Rome, Naples, Vienna, St. Petersburg, and London. Vigi Lebrun finally returned to France in 1801, where she continued exhibiting in the Academy salons until 1824. Extraordinarily productive, her name has been attached to over 800 paintings. All right, let's talk about the French Revolution. On July 14, 1789, a shouting mob of Parisians stormed the Bastille, a fortress used as a jail for political prisoners. With the help of soldiers who rallied to their cause, they eventually took the Bastille. It was a triumph for the workers. At the time, King Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette were asleep in Versailles. Soon after, the king was forced to agree to a constitution and bill of rights. These documents were inspired by the French philosophy of enlightenment, which held that the principles of scientific reason could be applied to all of life. In addition to reason, enlightenment philosophers also believed in progress and liberty. Such ideas were dangerous under an absolutist monarchy like Louis XVI. They had already proved dangerous in the American colonies where they provided the intellectual underpinnings of the American Revolution in 1776. The French Revolution. Although the first few years after the Bastille were comparatively moderate, the French Revolution did not remain so. In 1793, in reaction to the king's intended deceptions, the people turned against him and executed the, fam the royal family and hundreds of other nobles in what is called the Reign of Terror. After the excesses of the terror, many French people began to desire a powerful leader to reestablish control and renormalize life. They found their leader in Napoleon Bonaparte, who began his rise to power in 1799. From 1800 to 1810, Napoleon ruled the greatest European empire since Rome, but his crazed ambitions eventually proved his undoing. His invasion of first Spain and then Russia ended in disastrous retreats, but before he was defeated, Napoleon, like Louis XVI before him, 
I'm sorry, like Louis the Fourteenth before him, established his impact on posterity through patronage of the arts. The role of propaganda and the artists who produced it during the French Revolution. The French Revolution marks the point when one of the major cultural roles of art was as propaganda for the state. Such propaganda attempts to link the personality of the individual citizen with the personality of some heroic figure who personifies the state. Successful propaganda art produces icons that give the individual the experience of being at the center of the world of the state. A forerunner of the forms of propaganda used so extensively in our own day is the propaganda machine of Napoleon Bonaparte. But the career of the painter of the revolution, Jacques-Louis David, begins before the revolution starts when his patron, King Louis XVI, commissions the famous Oath of the Horatii, which we have already seen. All right, so Jacques-Louis David before the revolution. Let's look at the work of Jacques-Louis David, the great French painter, and his shifting role as propaganda master during the shifting politics of the French Revolution. The artist who directed the French Revolution's search for new icons for the state was Jacques-Louis David. David became famous just before the revolution in France with, the classic, with classically inspired paintings like the Oath of the Horatii. David's oath had been commissioned by an agent for Louis XVI. Later, uh, David, as deputy, voted to send his patron to the guillotine. His oath was first seen as an image of royal allegiance, but was later viewed as a, quote, manifesto of revolutionary sentiment. Another of David's paintings, The Death of Socrates, pictured the famous Greek philosopher choosing death rather than to accept the unjust verdict rendered by the Athenian political process. Paintings like these caused intense discussions when they were shown at the semi-annual Paris art salons. They appeared to support the anti-king and anti-church sentiments that were growing in France at this time. David hoped that his painting would electrify the public and make them more open to political change. The prime icon of the heroic cult of the Revolution of Reason is David's portrait of the journalist and leader of the Paris proletariat, or the working class, Jean-Paul Marat. Marat is shown after his murder by the Republican patriot Charlotte Corday in 1793. Corday murdered Marat because she felt he had led the revolution beyond the original Republican goals to something approaching anarchy. Marat became a martyr of the revolution, and his death inspired a cult that venerated his memory, uh, much like that of a saint. They used to parade and carry this painting through the streets of Paris. David's death of Marat is one of the first of the modern images of heroes that, unlike er, that like earlier paintings of saints, reinforce the myth of the modern state as defender of the common man. And we can note that related images of George Washington were being painted in the United States at this same time. All right, painter of the revolution. Uh, David continued to manage the image of the new cult of reason when the revolution struck with its furious and almost uncontrollable energy. He was a member of the most radical group, the Jacobians, whose leader Robespierre initiated the infamous reign of terror. Uh, uh, David himself was called the Robespierre of the Brush. During this period, as pageant member, master of the Republic, yes, that was his official title, uh, David designed great national festivals whose aim was to give the people of France a new synth, a sense of myths, mythic unity under the banner of human reason. The French Revolution eventually turned on Robespierre and required his death on the guillotine. David was also arrested. He expected to be executed. Instead, there was a period of general amnesty. And the need of the new leader of the revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte, for a master propagandist, brought David back into artistic power. Uh, David served Napoleon well. So again, he's completely changing directions, right? From First, from supporting the revolution, now he's uh, serving Napoleon. 
Um, David served Napoleon well. He painted an elaborate spectacle of Napoleon's coronation. David painted Napoleon crossing the Alps as successor to Hannibal and Charlemagne. And if you look on the rocks down here, you can see Bonaparte's name painted above that of Hannibal and Charlemagne. Although compellingly realist in appearance, David's image again manipulates and rewrites history. David uses all of his skill to convert an event into a glorious icon. He shows Napoleon heroically charging through the Alps on horseback. Napoleon actually crossed this path on a donkey in the middle of a storm. Napoleon's ambitions are flattered and confirmed in the painting, and David has accomplished his propagandistic goals. All right, so we're just going to review David's complicated career. He starts out his career with a commission from King Louis XVI for the Oath of the Horatii. But David changes the composition, so the painting acts not as a support of the monarchy, but to encourage the French people to question the monarchy. So it's nice to get the king to uh, pay for something which is not supporting the king. David becomes very involved with the most brutal supporters of the French Revolution, the Jacobians, and is close friends with Robespierre, who starts the Reign of Terror. David votes to kill his former patron, Louis XVI. During the Revolution, uh, David painted iconic paintings of the martyrs of the Revolution and organized big festivals to support the Revolution. But Robespierre uh, falls from favor and Napoleon comes to, to power and needs a master propagandist. And David takes the job and escapes execution. He serves uh, Napoleon well during his reign and finishes his career painting and teaching students. All right, so this is the end of the Baroque, part 2A. Uh, join me again for part 2B. Thank you.